Without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back into the Buster Show. Today, we have a personal hero and legend in my eyes, Walt Clyde Frazier, Hall of Famer, NBA champion. There isn't much more to say. Everybody already knows you. I appreciate you. Yeah, greatest Nick of all time. Yes, sir. <laughs> I have to ask to start this off because it hasn't happened in my lifetime. Um, what was it like to be on a winning New York basketball team, period? Well, it exceeded any expectations that I had. Uh, I never knew what New York was like. You know, when I was in college, we came to the NIT. <clears throat> so that was my first introduction to New York sports fans. And I was hoping at that time the Knicks might draft me, but I never thought it would happen. So then coming to the team and winning and winning a couple of championships, being an all-star, uh, it's just like a fantasy, man. It's just the, the greatest feeling in the world. Uh, you know the Knicks fans are the best in the world. The New York fans are the best in the world, the most knowledgeable, the most passionate. So playing in this city, there's, there's no, nothing like it. Oh, man. Do you have any favorite memories from back in, in that first championship year? Were there any games? I know you've, you've had some special game sevens. I'm, I'm familiar. Um, was there, is there anything that really stands out from that first championship year? Yeah, the, like I say, the crowd. The Knicks had been the doormats of the league for so long. And finally, we were winning. We were beating the Celtics. We were beating the Sixers. We were beating the bullets, so the fans were elated. And, uh, you know, every game was sold out. Madison Square Garden, 19,500 people. So we were like rock stars, man. Everywhere we went, I couldn't spend any money. People would buy me food, buy me drinks. Oh, man. <laughs> so obviously, I was, when I started dressing, I became Clyde, got the Rolls Royce. So every night I was out on the town having a good time, going to all the different nightclubs, you know, hanging out with Joe Namath and Cleon Jones, Tommy Agee, those guys, uh, football guys. So we were very close. And uh, it was just a fun time to be in the city. Tom Seaver. So we all had a good rapport. And remember, we all won a championship in 1970. Wow. That's Mixed so the Mets and the Jets, yeah, yeah. So did the trifecta. So the stars on every on every New York sports team, you guys would hang out with each other regularly. Yeah, yeah. We used to go down First Avenue. They had a place called Mr. Labs. Obviously, Fridays. You've heard of Fridays. Yeah. Uh, Wilt Chamberlain had a place up in Harlem. So it was just so much fun to just hang out, and we were. You know, at that time, yeah, athletes weren't making a lot of money. Mm. Remember, only Namath. Namath came in making a lot of money. Yeah. He was the only guy making money. The rest of us were just having a good time. <laughs> at least everybody was paying for everything for you. <laughs> right, right. And, then, you know, you didn't worry about an apartment in those days. Apartments were free, but you could just get an apartment at any time. Mm. So the living was easy. Nobody was stressed out, you know, the harmony between black and white, everything was copacetic, man. So we had a good time. It was a good time to be uh, in the New York City. Did you ever play sports with those guys? Like, would you guys ever go out to a baseball field and hit balls or a court and shoot hoops or anything like that? Yeah, for charity, we did that. You know, we do some baseball stuff. They do some basketball stuff. But don't play basketball. Don't play football players basketball, man. <laughs> Try to set a pick on them. <laughs> They'll run right over you. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely not trying to. Yeah, they, they, they're very physical. So, uh, but uh, a lot of those guys, you know, and like me, they played uh, uh, multi sports in, in, in college and high school. You know, in high school, I played football, basketball. I was a quarterback in football, basketball. I was a catcher in baseball. So I did that until I went off to college when I just focused on basketball. What made you focus on basketball? Were you just frankly better at it than the other sports? Or was there something, in, did you enjoy it more? What was it that made you go down the basketball path? Well, I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. So football is king in the South. So football was actually my favorite sport, but there were no black quarterbacks. Wow. 
This is 1963 to, you know, I came out of high school in 1967. There were no black quarterbacks. And I didn't think I had the speed or quickness to, you know, they usually turn you into a wide receiver or defensive back if you were black. So at that point, I figured my best option of, and I wanted to be a pro player. So I thought basketball was my best option. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, and then you go to you go to New York. You're playing. What you you mentioned your fashion for a second there. What inspired those first creative suits? I know you just love going to actual, you know, material places and sifting through stuff and just having a good time looking at all the variety. How like anybody is passionate about anything like that. Um, what what was it that really got you into the creative suit game, let's say? <clears throat> well, to understand the present, you have to know about the past. When, when I came into the NBA, we used to always dress up. Everybody wore a suit and tie to every game. We were always trying to outdress each other. Uh, you, you see, like today, okay, the guys dress like rappers, right? Right. <laughs> NBA players. So when we came out, we dressed like Motown. We dressed like Marvin Gaye, the Four Tops, the Temptations. When these guys performed, they wore a suit and tie. So that's how we went to the game. So uh, I used to copy Dick Barnett was a good dresser, Willis Reed. And I used to go where they had their suits made. They had custom-made suits, custom-made shirts. So I used to go where they had their stuff made. But what set me apart was the hat. When I bought the wide brim hat, and that's how I ended up with the nickname Clyde because of that from the movie Bunny and Clyde. I played Donaway, Warren Beatty. You know, I used to steal the ball on the court. So that's how the evolution of that happened with my fashion image. Ah, that's so awesome. How many suits would you say you own to date? Or do you give them away after you wear them? Do you only wear suits once? How does that whole process work? Well, I used to give them to my best friend. We were the same size. My, my old clothes, uh, my brother, I have a younger brother. Sometimes he could wear them. Uh, I have hundreds of suits. Wow. Because <laughs> <laughs> suits uh, for a man, it's not like the, the fashions don't change as quickly as for women. Right. You know, you have a wide lapel, you have a notch lapel, you have a shawl collar, you know, like that. It's a wide tie, it's a thin tie. So, uh what I've been able to do is maintain my weight so I can still get into my old clothes. And that's why I've accumulated so many suits over the years. But every year I make at least uh, 10 or 11 suits. I have 10 or 11 suits made. You know, I'm a Nick commentator now. Of course. So on MSG. So, yeah, that's what I do. Maybe I make 10 or 11 suits every year, new suits to incorporate into the other suits. Um, I like shopping, man. I like Hey. I like dressing up. I like going out. I like I like doing that. Like the way that a lot of players are today, you call a guy who collects a lot of sneakers a sneakerhead. If there was an equivalent, you would be that for suits. <laughs> right, right. Uh, I'm, I'm always looking for fashion, do uh, new ideas. I am so impressed. I've heard President Obama say that he only had four suits when he was president, <laughs> and you've got hundreds. You are <laughs> in the game. Um, <laughs> and I design them. I, I, I might, you know, a lot of these guys have stylists now. They have people that select right. their clothes. That's and all you. I, I think, yeah, I, I select every tie, every, every shirt, every coat. You know, I really enjoy doing that. A lot of that I, I acquired from my father. My father was a good dresser. Mm. You know, my brother is also a good dresser. He's not as flamboyant as I, but, you know, he likes to style and try to profile too. What do you think is the is is you know so important about dressing well? Because I've heard everybody say you know have different answers on this, but what is the importance of dressing well to you? Well, if you're a professional and if you're an icon, people are looking up to you. So I think you should always try to set a very positive example. I'm I'm, I'm a role model to a lot of people. So when I go out, people are watching me. What not only what I'm wearing, but how I'm acting, how I'm talking, how I'm walking. So uh, the other thing, I'm the oldest of nine kids. Wow. So I was a role model even before I knew what the word meant. 
when my parents weren't around, they told me I'm in charge. You know, I have seven sisters and one brother. So what, what are the odds of that? <laughs> yeah, right. So I was always cognizant of that from my, from my youth, you know, Walt, you have to do this. You have to carry the family name. My mom was always telling me, you know, you, you got to set a good example. So I just grew up doing that. And once I became a celebrity, I continued to do so. I never wanted to embarrass my fans with drugs or alcohol, some negativity that I did off the court. So I was very cognizant of that. That's so impressive. And one thing you also mentioned was how you've been able to stay in shape, you know, all the way through. I know you have a, you, you're very cognizant of your diet. What does that diet look like for people that are trying to look like you at one day? Well, when I came into the league, I, I ate everything. My motto was, what is a meal without dessert? <laughs> I used to eat pies and cakes and, and uh, pancakes. I mean, my diet was horrid. And, and after three or four years in the league, you start, you know, accumulating a little weight and you go, man, I got to do something. So I had some good role models. Dick Barnett was like, he was maybe eight or nine years older than me and he was in excellent shape. He didn't smoke. He didn't drink. So he, he helped me with uh, vitamins. I started taking vitamins. Uh, most basketball players don't eat red meat or pork, fish, chicken, turkey. So I started to read a lot of health books, going to the health stores, buying food. And it's just a, a culmination of all those years of me striving to, to, to keep my weight, to maintain my weight. Uh, I was one of the first guys to do yoga, like in 1973, no one had even heard of 1975. People didn't know what yogurt, they never, they thought I was talking yogurt, you know, they like, what flavor? <laughs> tell them that you were doing yoga and they would ask what flavor? Yeah, yeah, right. I go, I like yogurt. They go, what flavor? <laughs> <laughs> so I do some, at least some of that every other day, every day, an hour stretching just to, to, to get in touch with myself. You know, to sit down, uh, sometimes with music, sometimes without music, where I just get into myself and I do my different stretches. Right in bed, I do them before I get up. Uh, my, my exercise routine is I have a, a universal machine in my apartment. I have free weights. I have a stationary bike. I have a bench. So uh, like today, you know, I'll ride the bike for 20, 30 minutes. I'll do arms, I'll do shoulders, and the next day I might do chest and back. So at least three or four times a week, I'm, I'm working out doing something. That's very, very impressive and amazing. And it, it's uh, something to aspire to, to do for as long as you have, um, without a doubt. I want to ask, um, because, you know, uh, from what I've heard back in the day, players didn't really lift weights the same way that they do today. Is that, was, was there a moment where you saw that change or, or when did weights and weightlifting really become super important for basketball players? Well, you know, we didn't have the knowledge. Our trainers weren't as educated as these trainers are today. Our trainer we used to be a baseball coach. <laughs> really? Yeah, he was just good at giving massages, man. He couldn't tape your ankle. <laughs> You might tape your ankle to the table. <laughs> you know, so it was amazing. You come into the professional ranks and they have nothing, uh, no doctors or anyone working with you on how to keep your body. Like like I say, I learned from the players about vitamins, not from any manic management. And you're right. In the beginning, because of lack of education, basketball players thought it would affect their shot. You see, that's why they didn't lift weights, because you get too muscular, you know, like a, like football players, you want your, you don't want your muscles to contract. You want to keep them loose and flexible. Mm -hmm. But my problem was I was never that fast. I was never that strong. So when I went to college, we had an, uh, a guy named Doc Spackman who invented uh, isometrics. He was the inventor of the isometric exercise. So I went to him and he put me on a weight program. And I told, I mentioned to him about, 
you know, would it affect my shot? He goes, no, as long as you stretch. So once you do the weights, you just got to stretch to keep the flexibility wow. right and not allow your muscles to contract like that. So, so he said, no, as long as you keep your flexibility. And, man, I saw so much improvement my first year. Wow. And from doing the weights. And I, I when I came into the pros, I was light years ahead of those guys. They didn't know anything about weight training. And, you know, and dieting and all of this stuff that I knew how to tape my own ankles. Mm. You know, they had to wait on the trainer to do that. I knew how to tape my own ankles because we had to do it in college to minimize the injuries if you turn your ankles. So I came in uh, well above, well prepared. Even my coach, uh, you know, with defense, that was always my forte. I was always played uh, with coaches that stress defense and teamwork. There were no prima donnas on the team. I played in grade school, high school, college. Everybody was treated the same on the one set of rules. So I never got cocky, you know, never thought I was better than someone else on the team. And uh, that kept me very humble. And it still does. I'm still a very, very humble player, very team oriented wow. player. That's important. Do you ever shoot around any, these days? Why are you challenging me? I'm definitely, I'm, still, I'm not challenging you. Is, you know, I still give basketball camps. I know. In That's 1967, true. when the Knicks drafted me, we used to do ca uh, camps up in the Catskill for the kids. Yeah. So I still do Walt Frazier basketball camps. That's one of the highlights of my year. When I go to one of my basketball camps, none of the kids were born when I played. <laughs> Man. You know, they were in my number. They were in Puma sneakers. And, but the main thing that I learned, when I come to the camp, the kids are calling me Clyde. Mm. Hey, Clyde, hey, Clyde, hey, Clyde. But uh, you, you see a lot of pro players <clears throat> have camps, but they never show up. Right. They might come the first day. And they might come the last day. <laughs> but I'm there every day. And I tell the kids, I'm going to be here every day, so – you don't have to worry about getting autographs, pictures with me. So by the end of the camp, all the kids are calling me Mr. Frazier. That's amazing. Out of respect that I told him something that I was going to do, and I did it. Ah, uh, that's awesome. I love that. Yeah, yeah my, my grandfather, his name is Steve, and he is a lifelong Knicks fan. He told me that, you know, the moment he realized that he should, you know, probably start do, you know do another workout and stuff like that was when he was on the basketball court and he was guarding players who are 50 years younger than he is <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah right you gotta think about getting in the gym a hundred percent um but right now i don't i don't shoot that much i don't really go out usually around when september or october come because that's when you're normally in training, my palms get itchy, you know, I got to get a, yeah, I get a feeling like I would just want to go out and shoot some and do some stuff. So usually I have my camp in August. Mm. So like I said, I'm there every day. So I, you know, I wear shorts and shoes and that's normally when I get my, other than that, like I said, I'm on a stationary bike, I'm doing the weight training. Amazing. I want to ask, at, at what point, um, you know, after you stopped playing, did the idea of broadcasting, you know, be of interest to you? Was it of interest the entire time? And when did the opportunity come your way? It's a good question. It was all serendipitous. When I retired from basketball, I, I, I never had a really a game plan. Hmm. You know, I was 34. I was like wondering, what am I going to do? So uh, when I was inducted to the Basketball Hall of Fame, 1987, I was doing a series of interviews and the Knicks approached me about perhaps doing some radio or TV. And that's how I actually got into to the broadcasting field. Oh, that's amazing. Now, looking back, you know, obviously you are one of the very few broadcasters who have a, something distinct, your Clydeisms, you know, everything of that nature. Is there anybody in the past, maybe Marty Glickman, who has inspired you um, in terms of, you know, creating new ways to talk about the game we love? 
Well, you know, early on it was Marv Albert. Mm. Marv had the facials, and you know, he became a renowned Nick broadcaster during my playing career. And uh, what happened when I started doing radio, uh, Marty Glickman used to critique me after every game. I had to go to Marty. And Marty has worked with everybody from, from me, Joe Namath, any of the guys you see on, on TV, he, he works with them to help groom them and make them better. So he, he, was, he was instrumental in my being more descriptive and that he go, Clyde, when you do radio, you have to assume that the audience is blind. They can't see. So a guy's not on the baseline. He's on the right baseline. You know, he's he's on the dotted line. He's at the top of the key. You know, he's in the painted area. So you got to be more descriptive. Right. And after going to him, uh, you know, like 10 or 11 times, I got, I got the hang of it. And, but then I knew I had to improve my vocabulary. So that was the other thing that gave me a lot of confidence, too. Because on radio, there's no script. You can't read anything. Everything is spontaneity. Of course. Right. So you got to get in and out. And, and the, the, the color guy on radio doesn't have much to say. If you ever listen to them, they rarely say anything. So that's how I started rhyming. Because the guy wouldn't let me say anything, so... Uh, when the Knicks were moving the ball, I go, they're dishing and swishing. That was about all I could get in before he would come in, excuse me, Walt, you know, he just run right over me. So I would go, they're ubiquitous. <laughs> they're omnipotent. <laughs> where where would you pull these words out of? Were you reading a dictionary before games? Where did they come I, uh, from? I used to carry a dictionary around with oh, me instead yeah. of the dictionary. And I had books and books of words and phrases. You know, I like the way they sound, you know, like frequent flyer. If I, I see bulldozer finesse, I thought of Charles Oakley, you know, oh, running over somebody with bulldozer finesse, you know, shaking and baking, wheeling and dealing, huffing and stuffing. So just like with fashion, I was always listening for new words. Mm. You know, provocative flair, man. He's relentless, you know. He, uh, he's discombobulated. <laughs> so that's how I saw so all these words. I, You know what I used to do? I used to get the New York Times, mm. the arts and leisure section on Sunday, and just read through there and write down the words and the words that I like, and I could relate to different players and different situations. So that's how I, I improved my vocabulary. Oh, that's amazing. I love that. Now, how did radio differ from when you started doing TV? Which do you like more? And what, what are some of the differences there from- the Great other? question, man. I love radio better. You do? The radio, you just do the game. Mm. So we're not dealing with celebrities, showing you celebrities. <laughs> you just doing the game. And that's why if you have two good radio guys, TV can't compete. You know, people used to turn down the TV and listen to me and Mike Brink on the radio. Wow. Yeah. Or Marv Alvin when he was on the radio and that's what they would do. Cause it's like bang, bang. You, you, you're given the action. Like I say, there's no script. Everything is creativity, you know? Uh, so I really love radio. So when they moved me to TV, obviously it's more exposure, more money, but it took me like half a season to adjust because when the game is going on, we're not just doing a game. We're talking about celebrity role, <laughs> you know, then we're Stop selling your stuff. Like social yeah. stars. <laughs> right, right. Then we're selling your stuff over here and then we get back to the game. And and when I used to leave the radio booth, I, I, I would be perspiring, man. I feel like I worked. When I did TV, I leave, I didn't like I didn't even work. I'm like, that's it? You know what I mean? It was like uh, so much easier and laid back, man. I, I so I obviously I prefer radio, but TV is where the exposure is, the money is, and all that. But I lo I love radio. That's so funny. I and I I wonder too. Do you think? Because um, a little bit of context. So my background in high school, I did play by play broadcasting for the local sports and everything like that. And I always found we had a local TV station too, but. In terms of uh, broadcasting sports, 
um, between radio and TV, radio, you have that extra second or two seconds to be that much more creative because they can't see what's happening. They don't know if you're a second behind game action. Whereas on TV, if Mike Breen is a third of a second behind Carmelo's game winning three, you know, it's a, it's just a totally different world. Right, right. Yeah, so the difference in radio, when I did radio games, I get to the game 10 minutes before the game. <laughs> When you do TV, you got to be there hours, two hours, two and a half hours before the game. Getting there before the players. Right, right. Yeah, to have meetings and, and you know, so it's a lot more preparation. But so, ha but the way I, w I would advise anybody to start in radio and then go to TV, it's an easier transition hmm. because half the stuff I used to study on radio, maybe I only got in 10% of it. But it gave me good study habits. Right. And knowing that I can't read anything, man, you gotta know this. You gotta know these numbers in your head. So when they when when they talk about Pastor Ewan, yeah, he's averaging twenty points, ten rebounds, three block shots. Shooting five, forty eight percent from the field, you know what I mean? Eighty seven yeah. from the free throw line. <laughs> you know, you gotta know because you can't read. And T V you can sit and read because there's no urgency to do anything. You can sit and read that stuff. So if you go from TV to radio, you're not going to be as good as going from radio to television. Right. Now, obviously, the the duo that I grew up watching as a Knicks fan, you and Mike, how how did that relationship start? And were you guys, did you guys have that level of chemistry from the very beginning, or was it something that was built? Yeah, from the get-go, we had chemistry. We did a, a simulated game, and and right away. But Mike respected me. Like you, he was a big fan of mine. And uh, so he gave me a little more leniency to talk more than most guys. He, he regretted that after a while, but, <laughs> 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 but, uh, but we, we've never had an argument, man. Can you believe this? Mike and I have never had a disagreement. Uh, no, never had an argument on about talking too much or what I what I'm doing we never did wow that's out of respect we had a lot of respect for each other that's the key not letting your ego get involved with things a hundred percent do you have a favorite game you've ever broadcasted I know there have been some great ones uh you know at the garden and you know obviously traveling with the teams on the road but is there one game that stands out to you as being most exciting from a broadcaster standpoint I would say the Bulls, the Bulls series when they had Michael Jordan and the Knicks were good. Yep. Mike and I couldn't believe we were doing those games and actually getting paid to do them. <laughs> right, you would be paid. <laughs> right, getting paid to do this, man. We'd be doing it for free. Right, that's fun. So that, those games, man, especially in Chicago. Chicago Stadium was an old place where it didn't have acoustics. Mm. So when it got loud in there, I could bear, I could hardly hear Mike. You just say, say uh, the, the Knicks come down and the guy goes for a layup and Pippen blocks his shot, get the rebound, they throw it out, Jordan goes down and dunk, man. You couldn't hear it in your ears, man. That place was so loud. Wow. You know, then they had Benny the Bull. They had the love of Bulls. They had all this stuff going on. On the side when the team would call a timeout, man, and they just start. You know, I still get chill bumps from that, thinking of that. Or like when the, before the game starts, you see how the Bulls come out. They're real cocky. You know, they know they're world champions. You know, and Jordan is the last guy to come out. So the way they walk around, they're strutting. You know, they go through that, man. And it was just the whole ambiance of, of, of being there, Chicago Stadium with the Bulls and, you know, perhaps the greatest player ever in Jordan and, and Pippen and the rest of those guys. They must have been feeling like they're the 73 Knicks or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They feeling higher than that, I'm sure. They had the same advantage, man, the home court advantage that was overwhelming. Mm. You know, they never thought they would lose at home. Definitely. Now, speaking of, of Jordan and guys like that, you know, I think something that we talked about at the beginning of this podcast was how much things have changed in terms of being trainers, being educated and things like that. 
Is that one of the main reasons why, you know, you and, and many NBA Hall of Famers and legends think that we can't really compare players from different eras just because the games are so different and the education is so different. Do you, do you, are you in that same boat? In a, in a way, the travel, <laughs> hey man, we used to travel in, on day of games. Really? Yeah. Whoa. You know, these guys live in Ritz Carlton, the four season. We lived in a holiday inn out in the boondock somewhere. We flew commercial, man. They have a private plane. Right. So just that aspect there is rest. The rest that these players are able to – and the knowledge of of health and fitness. <laughs> like I alluded to, we didn't have that that these guys have. These guys train all the time. They train year-round. They got they, – they, they have a – uh, you know, you know, we we used to have one coach and one trainer, man. That was it, and the players. You had a head coach and a head trainer. And that was it. And a trainer. That's it, and the players. Right. So these guys have four or five extra coaches. They have a have two or three trainers. They have a fitness coach. They have a masseuse. You know, a dietitian. I mean, they've got everything. You know. So how much better would we have been if we had those those advantages? Yeah. But one thing I can say though, these guys, the, the the size and speed, you know, something that we didn't have. If you look at our Nick team, Bradley, Frazier, Monroe, the Busher, even Reed. Reed was maybe six nine. Right. He was I'm six four. Bradley, these guys were so much taller, man. And and what they 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 do the same thing that we do like Magic Johnson came in at six nine and a point guard, unheard of. Now the average height for a point guard is six eight six seven. Right. It's... You know, so the evolution of the game in that respect. But uh, the other thing though that would separate us from these guys is hand checking. Mm. See, today you can't touch players, man. You can't intimidate them like we used to do. With elbows, you come into the paint, you're going to pay. But we can hand check you. I could keep my hand on you the whole game, on your hip, pushing you around. It wasn't a foul. That's got to be so tiring. Tiring, man. It's like carrying an extra five pounds around. And as a rookie, that's one of the biggest transitions you had to make. With guys, I used to have bruises, man, back and blue marks on my, uh, on my midsection. From wow. guys just pushing you around. That's, see, you can't do that. So if you can control guys like that, it's easier to play defense. Mm. So that's why it's difficult to stop guys today. You can't put your hands on them. You can't, you can't touch them. Do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing on the NBA's end? Is there anything you would change about today's game? It was a, it was a necessity because the players are not as good as shooters as we were. Mm. You saw the games with the Knicks, 86, 87. <laughs> they couldn't they could score 100 points. So they had to get some continuity where the offense – remember how Pat Riley was criticized for killing the game? The Knicks, man, they were so physical during the playoffs. There was no – yeah, people didn't like it. So that's why they opened the game up. You know, take your hands off of them. So, so now you see the games are going up. When I played, every team averaged over 110 points a game. Mm. <clears throat> Whereas uh, you look back to three or four years ago, there, there's so many teams that don't average 100 points. Nice. You know, but now they're starting to because of the freedom to move and guys not being able to hand check. It's super true. So I guess a better question might be, um, instead of who's the greatest player of all time, because everybody's going to say a bunch, you know, most people say Michael Jordan or base. Maybe some people say like, you know, whoever, right? Who do you think was the most dominant player in their era? I think Will Chamberlain. That, no, Chamberlain. Will Chamberlain is the only Superman to ever play the game. What do you think was so special about his athleticism? What What was it about Will? His size, his athleticism, his will. He He, he wanted to dominate. He at the end of the game, he knew every stat that he had. <laughs> he did? Or, yeah, you know how many points, rebounds, that, that's what he did. He wanted to know everything, man. And his his records are hilarious. No one will come close to his records. Yeah. Average 50 points a game for a whole season. Can't do that. Yeah. Oh, man. 
play every minute of every game for a whole season. <laughs> Come um, on, man. Really? Yeah, it's, uh, if you, any record you name, like they talk about Jordan, how many times he had 50, 60 points, right? <laughs> 38 times. Will Chamberlain did that like 138 times. It's like, yeah, it's really it's, great. Yeah, it's like a, so to get back to what you're saying, the greatest player of all time, I always say, what's the criteria? Mm -hmm. If you're talking about the most dominant is Will Chamberlain, where, where the guy has all the records. Uh, you're talking versatility is Oscar Robertson, the guy who averaged a triple-double, you know, almost for his whole career. Right. Talking about winning is Bill Russell. Man has 13 world championships. Yeah. You know, so so what's the criteria? Michael Jordan is not the, the leading scorer in the history of the game. He's not the winningest player in the history of the game. He's not the most versatile player in the history of the game. So how how can you say he's the greatest player? When they talk about Tom Brady, they, they mention the six Super Bowl rings. Here's a man with 13 championship rings, Bill Russell. 13, man. Most of them almost consecutive. You're right. So, you know, why don't want they do that with him? But they don't. So and today, anybody who's almost playing today is the greatest. Like I, Tom Brady, I wouldn't say the greatest player in, in NFL history, man. Mm. He's not that versatile. You know, he, he was in the right system on a winning team. I, you, hey, man, I go back to Johnny Unitas. I was watching pro football in the 50s. Mm. Wow. Yeah, I used to watch the pro football in the field. I've seen Otto Graham. I, I could go back all the way back, man. I've seen all the – I saw Johnny United do stuff that was amazing, man. I saw all of these guys, the quarterbacks. So yeah. I would not tell you Tom Brady anywhere near uh, up there with some of the great quarterbacks. Do you think, though, um, like a lot of people on, online or whatever, people love to talk about this kind of stuff, um, but that they say, like, you know, the league was a little bit smaller and it was very different. Do you, does that weigh, hold any, any weight in your judgment on that? It's harder. You, you know how many times we played the Celtics? Ten times. Mm. I played you ten times. You know my every move, man. I can't fake you. <laughs> <laughs> right? You know every move. Like, hey, come on. Right. It, so it's harder when you have less teams. Like we had only, when I came in, maybe 12 teams. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you playing these guys 10 or 11 times, man. If you blink your eye, they know whether that's real or not. <laughs> they know your shot. They know everything about you. So it's much more difficult than playing 30 teams. When you play 30 teams, guys don't know anything about you in the Western Conference or the Eastern Conference. I've, that's so, so interesting. I've never heard anybody say that before. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so people say, yeah, there were fewer guys there were. Yeah, but it's more difficult. You, you know, and I don't think the guys were as talented. I would say today they are more talented, but they're not as versatile because today everybody's a specialist. Mm. Like you're a point guard, you don't shoot. Shooting guard, you don't dribble. So they took away the versatility of the players. You know, mm -hmm. they didn't want you to do one, one thing. So, like, the, you know, the power forward, they just want you to rebound and create havoc. You know, now if you're a center, you don't do it. You shoot threes. You can't, you just, so the whole game has changed in that respect, where one guy doesn't do like Oscar Robinson or a guy, or like Walt Frazier, rebound. When you were a guard, you had to rebound, you had to defend, you had to shoot, you had to do everything, man. Right. But they don't require that now from, from backcourt, man. That's really interesting. Um, so do you look at, at a guy like Jordan, like just the biggest star in, in the history of the game um, and also being one of, the, one of the greatest of all time? How do you look at, at, a, at a guy yeah, like Yeah, because of the era he played. That's why they're making him the greatest player. He had exposure. At that time when Jordan played, man, they were on the part. They were bigger than football. Their ratings were, were higher than football. Right. They had like 40, 50 million people watching the final. Right, right. You see, so that's why he's, he said that they say he's the greatest. Who saw Will Chamberlain? How many people are alive that even saw him play? 100-point game wasn't even on TV. Right. 
So, you know, that's why. It's, it's, you, you know, like, it's the same thing with the Heisman Trophy. The guys on the West Coast weren't, weren't winning it because we were sleeping in the East when they're playing. The people that vote, they're asleep. It's the, it's the exposure, man. Like, okay, just like you play in New York. More people are going to know you if you play in New York than you play in Cleveland. So this is just the way it is, man. The exposure of players and, and the publicity. You can make – you see, like today, you can go in a room, like guys go in a room, and we can create a a, a, a brand. Like they call it a brand. Right. We can sit down and say, hey, man, you, you do this and do that, and we try to come out. If we do a – it's like making a hit record. You hear it enough on the radio, and you go out and buy it. Hmm. You know, it's all PR. And when I played in the NBA, they were terrible at promotion. They never knew how to promote the players because of the nepotism. Like the, the owners of the team were hiring their friends and their relatives. <laughs> you know, they didn't go out and get PR people that knew how to promote the league until David Stern came to the NBA. Right. Then he had Jordan and those guys, and that catapulted the league to where it is today. Yeah, now where you guys like LeBron, I think often too, and I've just seen this myself, you know, whoever you grow up watching, you then think is the greatest because similar to the, you know, how you were saying the hit record on, on in the car, on radio, on TV, you know, the more times you hear it, the more times you see them win, the more you right. believe that they're the greatest because you haven't seen Will, Jordan, you, all these other, you know, amazing players. Right, because when they show the highlights, they're, they're so old. You, you can't relate to that. Right. Looking you know, at but, uh, the quality. You know, a lot of guys are bitter, man. I'd, I'd probably be bitter, too, if I wasn't still prospering from the NBA. You know, there are a lot of players that help create the NBA that can't get a job in the league doing anything. A scout, I mean, a PR man. If, if you look around the league, there are very few guys like me, my age, that are still in the league that are prospering from, from the league. So you have a lot of players that are angry with, with the NBA and what they've done and, and not helping the former players, man. You know, so it's good that I, I see now a lot of the teams are bringing, like the Knicks have us, they have Starks, they have LJ, they have Spree. So they're, they're helping the players, giving them an opportunity to continue to make money from, from the basketball. That's awesome. Yeah, and I know the, the Players Association, they're launching some new stuff. Um, to try to help some of the former players, which is obviously the more they can do, the better. Um, yeah, a lot of the players are destitute, man. It's sad, you know, when you see what it, what has happened. And we have a good pension plan where they take care of us now. They pay all of our health health expenses. No way, I didn't know that. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Um, I want to ask. It, I don't know if you know anything about this, but the sports card game, it since the beginning of quarantine really and a little bit before that because everybody was stuck in their houses and you know the last dance documentary came out, uh, which I definitely am curious your thoughts, but um, the value of sports cards have gone up significantly because everybody's at home and they're nostalgic and looking back and people are finding their old stuff and selling it. I wanted to ask you what you think the most a Walt Clyde Frazier card is worth. Uh, good question. I have no idea. Maybe my rookie card. I think the rookie cards are the most valuable. Yep. Your 1969 tops. That's the answer. But do you have any guess? $200. <laughs> so the correct answer is, so they grade them on one to 10 based on the condition. There is only one in the world that is a 10. Somebody has it, it's a private collector, and, you know, conservatively, $60,000. Kidding. <laughs> wow. People, and if, if that, because the thing, there's only one of them, so the guy is probably never going to sell it, but if he did, it, People love you, man. That's that's all that that means. <laughs> People want to invest in your card? Um, yeah, it's really it's. it's yeah, that's a, that's amazing. I, 
Yeah, I never, I never knew. Um, yeah, you, you still, you have your championship rings though, right? Yeah, I wear them every day. You wear them every day. How, <clears throat> how special does that make you feel? And how many people have asked to, uh, to see those? <laughs> They they ask to wear them, you know. Kids always let me wear them. I go, they won't come off. <laughs> Usually, so whenever I go out, I have them on. I feel naked without them. Mm. So, I, I, subliminally, I don't feel anything. I don't, I don't know. A lot of guys put theirs in a case. They don't wear their rings. But I, I wear them, like I said, every day. Man. I, when I go out, I'm wearing those rings. That's amazing. Um, so I guess it's a sense of pride that is symbolic of a perfect season. Everything has to go right uh, to win a championship. And then when you think about all the great players that have never won one, you know, that are still devastated by not – because today there's so much focus on the championship. Right. That's why you find all the movement, guys moving to different teams trying to win a championship ring. So, you know, it's in vogue. People want a championship, but I was fortunate enough to win a couple, and uh, uh, it's a very good sense of pride. That's amazing. Now, I imagine one of those places where everybody asks to see those rings is your restaurant. When, when did you decide to open this restaurant? Wise Wine and Dine, located at 10th and 36th. And 37, it's a whole block. Hey, it's great. 10,000, yeah, 10,000 square feet restaurant. Have a mini gym, mini basketball court there. Uh, steaks, chops, chicken, seafood. My favorite is the grilled salmon. I know you're uh, healthy man. Yeah, yeah, I always tell people I have nothing to do with the menu. I just meet and greet. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Just like in basketball, everybody's a specialist, right? At the restaurant, it's the same thing. That's your I, that's your position in the starting five. You the meet that's and greet. right. Meet and greet. I'm not a chef. I don't know, do anything with that. So, and that's why I'm in the restaurant business. I love meeting and greeting people, man. Talking to the fans about basketball. There's a new generation of kids that know me as the Nick announcer. So they come in wanting to take pictures and. Uh, it's really, when I was playing basketball, I never thought of owning a restaurant. I went to a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And my partner is a big Nick fan, a guy named Michael Weinstein. So he has a, a corporation under the auspices of ARC restaurants. So he owns restaurants throughout the country. So one day he approached me about perhaps doing a restaurant. I never, you know, really thought of it, but, and uh, we sat down one day, we we went and found Clyde's and, you know, the rest is history. And now, apart from the famous grilled salmon, what, what's your favorite part about the restaurant? Is it the, the court in there? What, is there anything special that, that you really love? When people come in and see me, they can't <laughs> believe it. They go, oh, I thought you were a court, uh, a cutout. I thought you were this or that. Because, like with the basketball camps I mentioned to you, the kids, there are a lot of guys that have basketball camps, they never show up. So it's the same with celebrities. Have you ever seen Michael Jordan at any of his restaurants? Not at his restaurant. <laughs> not going to see him, right. So when they come in, they don't expect to see me. And I'm in the front. When they come in the front door, I'm standing in the front. That's why they think I'm a cutout or something. <laughs> because I love that. Clyde wouldn't be standing there to greet us, man. Is he going to be meeting and greeting us? Yeah, so I stand there, I take pictures, I talk to them, and and that's part of the business. You got to give back. You know how many people are supporting me? Black and white, young and old, they come in there, man. It's just amazing. and uh, It's a very humbling experience. And when you think I haven't played basketball since 1980, <laughs> that I have a restaurant, man. It's, it's incredible. Clyde Frazier's Wine and Dine. Anybody, if you're listening to this and you haven't gone there yet, or if you've been before, go back, check it out. 
and let whoever is there know that you came from the Buster Show podcast that Clyde Frazier was a guest on. That's right. We'll give you a discount. We mentioned the Buster. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there anybody in, you know, that you see broadcast, like from broadcasting now that you wish you got the chance to play against? Like, do you ever wish you played against LeBron or Jordan? Is there anybody you'd really, like, I know you have that competitive nature about you. So is there anybody that you wish you Yeah, and your, your ego. But see, when I say, when you say play, I never think of playing with them. You know, like, I would have never thought of joining Jerry West. I want to kick his butt, man. Yeah. You know, uh, Bill Russell, I would have never thought of joining them. So when, you, when you're talking about these, I would love to have played against Magic because of my defensive prowess. Could I stop this guy? Or Jordan. So that's what I think about. When you mention those guys, Magic, Jordan, you know, yeah, man, I love to try to go up against them one-on-one, -on -one, like I did with the Pearl and Oscar and Jerry West. But I never would have thought of joining them. Mm. Never, man. Never would I. That's one thing that I, you know, I don't really like that the players do today to where they get together and try to have the best team to win a championship. You know, I never. Well, some people say, well, you play with Earl Monroe, you know, but we traded for him. Right. It wasn't like we conspired right. to, to get him, you know. Yeah, so. Uh, but that's the evolution of the game and what what they're doing now, man. They have three superstars on the team and the rest are role players. So That's so interesting. I want to ask you about Game 7, 1970, if I'm not mistaken. You put up 36 and 19, possibly the greatest Game 7 in the history of basketball. Maybe Come on, Buss. It was the greatest. Come on, man. 36 and 19, seven rebounds, four steals. I saw hot dogs at halftime. Come on, man. <laughs> Maybe in all of sports is what I was saying. Um, did you eat Well, when you think of the game being on the line, you know, seven game, that's it. Game seven, this is it. Do or die. Did you eat and, anything uh, special for breakfast that morning? What? <laughs> that morning I was in turmoil because we didn't know if Willis Reed would play. Oh, you know, right. Willis had gotten – Willis didn't play game six in L.A., and Chamberlain got, like, 36 points and 25 rebounds. So game seven, we were coming back to New York. Okay, there's no social media. So when I wake in the morning, I'm wondering if Willis would play. I'm calling, making a few phone calls. Nobody knows. So only when we got to the game did we know what the status of Willis was. And when we left the locker room, we didn't know, man, whether he would play or not. People think it was premeditated that we knew he would come out on the court. We didn't know. So we were just as flabbergasted as everybody else when Willis came out. But I'll never forget, I saw three of the greatest players in the world. Will Chamberlain, Jerry West, Elgin Baylor. They became mesmerized. They stopped doing what they were doing, and they were just staring at Willis. And when I saw that, it gave me so much confidence, man. I went to myself, we got these guys. You know, and then Willis would come out and make his first two shots. And I went, there's nothing wrong with this guy. <laughs> you know, but from making those first two baskets, the garden was in a frenzy, man. Wow. And that gave us so much confidence. Ironically, doing whenever we were in the playoffs, Red Holtzman would always pull me over. Red Holtzman was our coach. So this game, he pulls me over. He goes, Clyde, hit the open man. Hmm. This, this is what he told me. So when I went into the game, that was my, 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 what I was going to do. Like if we were playing the Bullets, he'll tell me, hey, Clyde, forget about offense. Just focus on defense with Earl. Right. So he told me, just hit the open man, make sure everybody get involved. So that was my mindset when I went in the game. But as the game progressed, I was the open man. <laughs> You know, I come over pick and roll. I was wide open. I had a shot. You know, I was stealing the ball. I was doing all these things. So I was going to the free throw line. So it was just ironic how I ended up with that type of game after what the coach had asked me to do. That's so interesting. 36 and 19. Wow. That's... Yeah, unequivocally my greatest game ever. My best all-around game. Uh, everything on the line. Uh, you know, obviously I had games where I scored more, but it didn't have that versatility, the consistency. Right. 
And there wasn't as much on the line, obviously. Kings. Yeah, and I was only 25 years old, man, in the greatest city in the world, first championship. You know, you right. asked me yeah. that early on. I wasn't, you know, that was that was the epitome. But you know what? After that game, nobody still said I was like Oscar Robertson or Jerry West. No mm -hmm. one compared me to those guys after having that type of game. You see, today, if a guy has that type of game, he's, he's one of the greatest. Nobody will ever forget. I had to have two more years of averaging 20 points, seven rebounds, defensive prowess, before they finally say that I was on a par with Oscar Robertson and Jerry West. Wow. That's amazing. And then I do also want to ask you um, about your passion uh, in St. Croix. You guys have 14 rental properties down there. You got a whole nother business down there? Yeah, for, yeah, a rental business. Again, it was serendipitous. I, I, I like the island lifestyle because of the water, fresh air, sunshine. It's very laid back. But in 1980, Hugo wrecked the island, the hurricane. It even came up north, too. It came up through New York with more of a tropical storm. But when I got my monies, I started improving my property. I even started buying properties that were available around me. So I have like five acres. And uh, I just started building these. Some of them are one-bedroom cottages uh, with the ocean view. Wow. Some have a garden view. Some have a pool. So I really like creating, just like with my fashion, I'm a, I, I decorate them, I landscape them, I design them myself. I create, it's my whole Clyde creation that I've done over 30 years. Wow. And then you guys rent them out to, you know, people? The tourists, yeah. Yeah, we rent them out to tourists. Do those tourists know that it's yours or do they have no idea? Yeah, because some of them I, you know, I'll be putting on the, the auspices of Walt Frazier rentals or whatever. So, um, yeah, they'll be pretty cognizant of that. You know, they're going to just hang out with Clyde. You know, I, I put them there. Sometimes I'm there if I'm not doing the Nick games. You know, when I'll be around, I'm available. So, you know, some of them are rented by the week, you know, a week, two weeks. The ones with the garden view, I use the rent kind of long term by like six months to a year. So uh, real estate is something I've always liked because I could see it. <laughs> very you know very I mean? tangible. Yeah. Right, right, very tangible, man. So uh, that's been my best investment. And, uh, you know, when I finally wind that down my career, that's where I'll be. And I'm also a sailboat captain. So I, I love sailing. I, I can take out six people and charge them. So I'm looking to get a get a boat soon. And, uh, you know, I'll be renting my properties and sailing people around the Caribbean. Man, I want to be like you when I grow up. The amount of, A, fun you have, and B, revenue streams you have is second to none. And the fact that you're doing it you know, with only stuff that you're passionate about is, is the best part. Is that, would that be your best advice to people who are younger and, you know, have a little bit of success in one industry and then, you know, want to diversify just to, to do what they love? If it's, yeah, you do what you love, it's not work. You know, it's a labor of love. So I love creating, decorating, uh, talking to the fans. Like I tell my friends, when I retire there, my only fans will be my ceiling fans. <laughs> 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 the, the roar of the crowd will be the ocean waves sitting on my boat. <laughs> that's very peaceful. That, that sounds amazing. And I think that's a, that's a great way to close off this podcast, my friend. I appreciate you greatly. Everybody, Clyde Frazier's Wine and Dine. Go check it out, please. Check it out. Check it out. I'm usually there on the weekends when the Knicks are in town, uh, signing autographs, taking pictures. So it's my pleasure. I hope they show up. Uh, thanks for having me, man, perpetuating the legacy of Clyde. Uh, you know, I grew up very quiet and shy. So the person you're talking to now is a culmination of all my years being a ball player. 
uh, interacting in New York, the Mecca for everything and mm. bringing out my personality. But then again, I, I, I reverted. I'm no longer Clyde. I reverted back when I'm in St. Croix. I'm Walt. Mm. Quiet and shy guy that I used to be. Uh, you know, that likes to, doesn't seek the limelight. Just a down to earth guy talking to the people, trying to help kids along the way or someone that I could help along the way. So ah, that's amazing. Well, well, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate you. Awesome. All right. Well,